Thanks for pressing play. This is Christopher Lockhead, Follow You Different, where we celebrate the people, ideas, and companies that stand out. And we are proudly sponsored by the awesome people at Oracle NetSuite. To turbocharge the growth of your business, check out netsuite.com slash different. Today, he's back. Our guest is none other than podcast legend, Jason DeFilippo. Jason is the executive producer of one of the most uh, high profile and successful podcasts in the world, The Jordan Harbinger Show. And he also co-hosts an extraordinary podcast called Grumpy Old Geeks. And today we're going to get our grump on. We're going to moan and groan, hopefully in a fun way. (laughs) And uh, we talk about things like facial recognition technology, uh, the fact that kale is becoming a baby name, why American Airlines and Marriott suck so much, and a whole lot more. Go to Lockhead.com, L-O-C-H-H-E-A-D, to check out the show notes for this episode, learn more about Jason, and grab the key takeaways. And we have a whole bunch of links about the various topics that we touch on. So strap yourself in. Hey-ho, let's go. Your face is a boarding pass and um, ID and a passport. This is an interesting concept. I'm I'm torn on this one. I see it as... It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Everybody's doing facial recognition, face ID, and things like that. But nobody's doing it right. Nobody's doing it right. You've heard about all of the stuff in Europe that's happened where people are, you know, what is it? Uh, I think it was a Wales police department that did this and got like a 98% or some ridiculous number because we all know 80% of statistics are made up on the fly. Uh, like a 98% <laughs> fail rate on, on the to game, like a footy game. Yeah. And they're just like, oh, yeah, but they did get one person. So they counted it as a win. Oh, but yeah. this is saying I, I that this guys is talk like, about this. Yeah, it's crazy. He just made up the statistic. I, uh, yeah, I totally did. Um, but they did get one person. But they said it was it, like almost everybody in the, you know, the stadium was flagged as being some kind of offender. <laughs> but they did find one guy. We got one guy. <laughs> But this is this is interesting. I mean, it's funny. I, I don't know if you've flown recently. I just flew in September for the first time in a long time. And uh, what's what's that, you know, fast pass thing that they have for getting through security? Yeah, uh, I think it's called clear pass. Or yeah, clear yeah, pass. yeah. Um, Am I yeah, the clear that? card. And the guy well, I was you, flying you with your fingers, your fingerprints. It's like a, you, you like swipe the card and give a fingerprint because we we're going to put it in back. Yeah. And. You know, they're like, oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. You'll be able to get through the line so much faster. And I got through faster by going through regular security than my friend in that went through the the clear pass line. So uh, this is one of those things. I I did that because, you know, got to the airport one day and big ass line at SFO. And so there were these very pleasant people sort of saying, hey, just come over here. And I'm like, that's a great idea. So I did it and got on the plane and I'm sitting on the plane. I went. I have no idea who I just gave my fingerprints to. Is that a government oh, yeah. agency? Is that a private company? Is that the airport? What did I? I don't even know what I just did. I did, but I just gave them my fingerprints. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a private company that uh, is yeah. outsourcing everything to the government because you know nothing, nothing is run by the federal government anymore. Not even the prisons. So, but uh, well, that's a whole other conversation. That's I a whole other. Shocked by how quickly I just gave away my fingerprints uh, for convenience and and didn't think about it and was sort of a a little spooked afterwards you know it's one of those things i was fingerprinted one time by the police because somebody broke into one of my neighbor's houses and it was it was a terrible crime she was you know raped and robbed and i had a a discrepancy in time with the cops because i just flown back from california the day before and i'm like oh i looked out the window and it was x o'clock And they're like, no, by X o'clock, this was going on. So they took me in and fingerprinted me and gave me the whole runaround. And then, of course, when they were done, they I'm like, so what's this guy supposed to look like? And he's like, well, he's 5'9 and 280. And I'm like, "Uh, I'm six feet tall and 220. So what the hell, guys? So I was wigged out by that. But now my fingerprints are on file. And for years, I've worried about that. So I know that feeling that you get that when you give up just that little bit of yourself to these people and you just don't know where it's going to, where it's going to end up someday. And so, you know, there's this theme I've been on that the, the, the future has happened. Right. And I just think about it and go, okay, so um, the Atlanta airport is the busiest airport I think in the world. And 
now Delta allows you to just use your face through security and as a, as, as a boarding pass. Like, that is a mind-blowing reality to me. Yeah, you sign, you basically sign in by looking at the camera, you get your boarding pass, and you just go and uh, drop your bags off by looking at the camera, and you go through TSA by looking at the camera. And they're saying that it's 90% accurate, but on this kind of thing, is 98% good enough? What do you think? Because that, I, that I 2%, uh, it, what, I don't know. I just don't know. It's very trippy. And uh, my friend Duncan Davidson says, you never want to be a Luddite. So, but we, it's the future is here. All right. Here's the next one we got. I, I thought you of all people would love this. I, I, I picked this for you in, in, in <laughs> honor of you, Jason. All right. There is an AI robot sulking in the International Space Station. So Why is he sulking? Had you heard this story? I've heard about Simone, the, the flying robot that we sent up there, the $6 million flying robot that kind of flies around because it looks like the face was designed with Windows Paint, but I haven't seen anything since it's gotten up there. Okay, I so you're going to love this story. So this robot, Simone, was, I'm reading an article on Quartz here, was supposed to be more than a colleague for the small team of astronauts aboard the International Space Station. Simone was supposed to be a friend. <laughs> but <laughs> Isn't that sweet? In its first recorded interaction in space, the floating robot head, voice user interface assistant, there's a category description for you, got a little yeah. testy. <laughs> Simone's engineers did everything they could to smooth over, the, over their robot's future interactions with astronaut Alexander Guest. Anyway, they go on to talk about the fact that Simone starts playing a song by a band you might remember called Kraftwerk called The Man Machine. Out of all the songs that it could play when it gets into space, they picked Kraftwerk? Craftwork of all things, exactly. That's then, a very specific, like, you know, taste subgenre right there. Well, it gets worse. So Gers, the astronaut, listened politely to the first 46 seconds of the song. So that's how far he makes it, Jace. Uh-huh. Even bopping along with his fist for a few bars. But then he reached out and shook Simone's head and said, please stop playing music. Anyway, the story goes on. Simone won't stop playing music. And they get into a fight about this music. <laughs> he got in a fight with a six million dollar floating robot yeah. head because it yeah. wouldn't stop playing music. Now, is this just bad programming, you think? Or like, did they just pick the wrong playlist? Like, maybe this is one of the programmers playlists and just threw it up there. And like, you know, everybody's like, ah, I don't like this. So he just kept playing it over and over again. It's like it'd be like a bad recommendation engine in space. But like. This is like a Tinder date gone horribly wrong. This is their first interaction, right? Well, and this thing was designed he's not to be this robot. guy's friend, right? He was yeah. his AI friend in space. Do, do, the first do we thing really they did was that? have a fight about about craft work music. <laughs> you know, they, they they could have tested this on the ground first. You didn't need to actually send the robot up there to do this. They could have sent like you know put the software on an iPad and done yeah. it. All right, here's what I heard recently that I don't know why, but it also made me think would be fun to talk to you about. Kale, K-A-L-E, is a baby name now. Yeah, yeah, doesn't surprise me. I, I don't know if you heard on our, one of our recent shows, we actually covered somebody who worked for an airline, actually made fun of a passenger because the child's name was A-B-C-D-E, also known as Absidae. And publicly shamed oh, them. Oh, no, really? Absolutely. Publicly shamed them over the like the voice, and then like took a picture of the boarding pass and posted it to their Instagram. Yeah, I had not heard that. How, how do you pronounce it again? Absade. Absade. Middle name. Oh. <laughs> well, hey, they get high points for creativity. Yeah, yeah, do. I, but kale, really? I mean, nobody kale. likes kale. Why would you name your baby kale? Everybody hates it, I, I except Obama. Like Obama loves kale salad. Well, I, I will, in defense of kale, though, I will say this. So I live with an Italian person, and she can cook. Like, I live, mm -hmm. in, I live in food heaven, and she makes a kale Caesar salad that, for, and I hate kale. Like, I, I'm not interested. 
It's fantastic. Okay. Well, Nick, when you invite me up there, I want to try it. It, I I want to try this because I've never had it. Everybody says like they have their kale dish and it's the best in the world, but nobody's actually delivered yet. So I never thought I'd be the guy defending kale. Yeah. You don't seem like that guy. (laughs) Yeah. I don't feel like that guy. All right, now I got a fun story for you. I like some of the other health food names in this article. Uh, You've got kale, you've got kiwi, you've got saffron. Saffron, saffron's not bad. Yeah, I like saffron. You know, it it sounds like a very healthy stripper name. That's kind of where we go with that. (laughs) And then I thought you might like this: Oaklin. Oak. Oak Oakland. A. Oh, like Oakland, the city. No, like like oak, like an oak tree, and Lynn. Stuck together. Jumped 1,072 spots in the ranking. Oakland. Wow. That's weird. Yeah. Why, why would that jump up? Is it, was it like a, it's like a character in some kind of, you know, Harry Potter book or something or some. Maybe, maybe. I, I, I'm completely oblivious, but it is, it is coming up the charts with a bullet. <laughs> it is called Casey Kasem. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs> All right. So this. So I'm going to look this up because there's, there's actually a site called Mom365. And the meaning of the name Oakland is, oh, guess what? There is no meaning for the name Oakland. And there, that's, that's it. what it says. <laughs> yep. It's, it's a female name, but there is no meaning under the name Oakland. That's funny. That's kind of sad. Yeah. But hey, you know what? Whatever name. Like. That's the beauty of this country. You're free to do whatever you like, and who the hell am I to judge? Hey, hey man, you know what it is? Um, I, I still say that one of the greatest uh, songs of all time is Johnny Cash is a boy named Sue. So right. you can at least get a good song out of it. Exactly. Oh, here we go. The alt meaning is O is for original, one of a kind. A is for action, something to take now. Key is K is for keen, your sense of honesty. L is for little, little things you do. Y is for yearn, your innermost desires. N is for nurturing, the care you provide to all. N is for neatness, your orderly way. This had to come from somewhere. This is crazy. This feels very made up to me. <laughs> oh, my this God. This feels very made up to me. Yep. Yep. But people are doing it. People are doing it. Must be one of those things, uh, you know, but it, it, you know, it's probably an Instagram meme that somebody just took and ran with. Now, hey, there's this crazy thing. Not, not. We're, we're going to get out of sequence on our notes here, Jason. If that's okay with you, I'm a little. Dude, jump around, jump around, jump up, jump up, and get down. I don't care. So I'm fascinated to have this conversation with you. Dude uses drone to catch cheating wife, right? So yep. This dude thinks his wife's <laughs> cheating on him, chases her without her knowledge. Uh, she goes to meet her boyfriend at the CVS around the block, right? Mm-hmm. And he's got it all on video, drone video, and he's edited it, and he cries, and he yells, and he, and he you know, it's... Breaks some glass, right. a very punk rock of him. So that happens. Then, mm-hmm. on April Fool's Day, he comes out and admitted, admits the whole thing was a hoax, but he does mm-hmm. it on April Fool's Day, and he specifically says, I will answer your questions... But I won't answer any questions about whether or not this video is a hoax. Mm hmm. So, yeah. Did, <laughs> what's going on here, Jason? Well, did you see the video where he pulls around in the minivan and flies the drone down and it's him standing there? Oh, no, I didn't see that one. Yeah. Yeah. He actually posted that one where, like, you know, she gets in the car, they drive away, and he drives her around the other side of the the you know building it comes back out and then has the remote control for the drone in his hand and flies it down and it's him the whole thing was a prank all the way across the board the thing about it is 14.5 million views on the drone used to catch my cheating wife video the video it, where he says it was a prank is like 16,000 so right no there's new and, articles yeah. written about it but, yeah but here's the thing why would he announce that it was a hoax on April 1st? Try and get more buzz, try and keep it a game. 
I think he's told. I, I think he's just trying to game the system. Honestly, I think he didn't get enough subscribes because you look at his subscriber count on YouTube, which we also both know that YouTube subscribe numbers are bullshit since they changed everything. It's fifty two thousand on YouTube for his channel. For somebody that has fourteen point five million views and has been on national TV, that's weird. That's a really strange number. That's what I'm saying. So that there, there's some there's some you know little ripples in the matrix here that something is wrong. So what what do you think's going on here? I think he's a bullshit artist, and so he you got think the whole thing's yeah, a hoax. I think the whole thing's a hoax, and he tried to like get more press to say it was a hoax, and then keep people guessing because he did it on April first. Because so then they would ask him back on the show, and then he wouldn't talk about it, so he so could get more us to get more downloads to get more ad revenue i think he's, he's a social a, media kardashian he's a, yeah it, well he's even worse he's just a, a straight up troll he's a tra- straight up troll i liked his first video though i thought he was very clever he was he, he was you know in my camp with you know at least you know the the outrage the outrage seemed real but yeah. Although you know it was we very well we, edited and you know how he sped it up and he sort of narrated it very well it was very well done i thought i was like this is very well done. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very professional video. You know why? Because he thought about it for a long time before yeah. he made it. <laughs> Crazy. All right. Now, this was another story that immediately made me think of you. AI news anchor makes debut in China. Did you see this thing? I'm, I'm pulling it up right now. I have seen the stories about it. I have yeah, seen the you stories. Gotta see the AI. You yeah, gotta see it. It looks good. He looks, you know, like a person. Yeah. You know? He He's actually pretty, based on a real news anchor. Yeah. I mean, there's still a lot of Uncanny Valley going on right here. And, you know, are you familiar with the Uncanny Valley? No. That's when something that looks fake and something that looks real, there's that there's a dip in perception between something that you know is fake, like a cartoon, you know, and then something that looks real, like real TV. Yeah. This guy is like, you know, he's he's coming up the curve on the Uncanny Valley because what it is, it's like, you know, your your perception of what that video looks like. You can tell that it's fake up until a certain point just because of little things, right. very tiny things but can trip not, us up. We're a long way from Max Headroom. Oh, man, I miss Max Headroom. <laughs> I miss Max Headroom. Right. That was a yeah. very uh, that was a very uh, iconic for the time character, wasn't he? Yeah. Was that Matt Frewer was was Max Headroom? I think that was his, the actor's name, but man, I love that show so much. Yeah, and he was in a lot of so ads much. and shit too, wasn't he? Oh, he made a fortune off of Max Headroom. Yeah, he was in Coke ad, or maybe he did Pepsi. I can't even remember, but he yeah. was definitely, uh, definitely made a lot of money off this. This is, this is just trying to, you know, be like a straight laced Dan Rather type of anchor man. You know, yeah, it's, I, I, it's I don't, trippy though. I kind of yeah. want a person reading me the news, don't I? Well, I think it would be cheaper, wouldn't it? I mean, come on. You can just pay somebody to read the damn news. Why do you have to create an AI anchorman to do this? I don't know. I, I, see, because, like, you know, if you think about famous news anchors, you, you just like with podcasts, you, you develop a relationship with them, right? Are we really going to feel a connection to this dude, this AI dude, this, you know, uh, Max Headroom? Well, look at Japan. Japan has a lot of virtual celebrities that never existed that people are actually getting yeah, married true. to. So that's what do you mean a, getting married to. Oh, you can get married to people that don't exist in Japan. It's kind of crazy. Uh, what, I think we what, actually. What? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> now you got to tell me. I got I got to pull this one up for you because you uh, can marry non-existent things in Japan. Yeah, y- you can. It's what well, it. <laughs> How does that it's basically an up? anime character and they do VR weddings. They this is an not. old, it's, it's an older thing, but you know, people are marrying people in VR that don't exist. <laughs> uh-huh. That's mental. Well, have you, have you been to Japan? I haven't, but I do enough I, research on Japan, Japan to know that many times things I'm, are very strange over in Japan. Well, so, I, like, you know, hey, I would just say it's very different. Like, this, and certainly, sense of humor is is very different. The other thing is, I know a lot of people like it, and this opinion gets me into trouble. But I think karaoke is the work of the devil. 
<laughs> well, the problem the problem I have with karaoke is that I think journey is the work of the devil and everybody goes to sing karaoke. They do a oh. journey song. Yeah, and so. nobody can hit those high Steve Perry notes. That's ridiculous. Yeah. No, it's a terrible terrible thing. Car- I mean, there there has to be a certain level of inebriation when it comes to karaoke and it should never be filmed and it should never it should never be in public without friends that you're just there are places in San Francisco that I used to go to where we would get a room like a soundproof room they had the TV they had the disco lights and you could just go do karaoke with your friends and and bring in your own booze and just get messed up and have a great time doing karaoke in public at a bar right not so much my favorite thing ever <laughs> it's just yeah. i'm with you on that but i think i think karaoke in small doses in a in a controlled environment it might not be bad <laughs> i'm actually going on a punk rock cruise for uh it's, it's, it's not a punk rock cruise it's flogging molly's cruise next year and they do punk rock Flo- karaoke so hold on, slow down. flogging molly has a cruise they've been doing it for years yeah how long is the cruise it's four days and do they play every night or how does how does this work? Well, I think I think they play uh, the headlining, but uh, there's I, I haven't been on it yet, so I don't know. But uh, an old skate punk band, The Faction is playing face to face is playing and Flogging Molly is playing. There's a bunch of other bands that are playing, too. But out of those, those three bands are on my bucket list because I never got to see them live. And so I'm going to go on that cruise. But but the upside is they do punk rock karaoke. So they have a band and you oh can come God. pick your song and you literally play with a real band and do karaoke with the band instead of looking at the TV with the, you know, the stereo. So, so I think I that is right, also uh, an alternate use of karaoke. That's good. If I say, OK, boys, beat on the brat by the Ramones, the boys just say, all right, we're going to play that. One, two, three, four. <laughs> you know, that's it. That's outrageous. Now, how many people are on this punk rock karaoke boat? I'm sure there's a, you know, probably a couple hundred. It's a, it's a regular cruise. And then they just, you know, take over part of the ship and use the, you know, the, the stadiums inside the the boat. I was on a a bunch of Irish. Is it one of those like a normal ones? Like a normal cruise ship? No, Enormo. One of those like giant floating city ones? No, I don't think. I think it's just a regular cruise ship that, that goes around, you know, the Florida Keys. You just hook around. Yeah, because I was on a couple Irish music cruises, and we just, we, you know, we spent a couple of days in Hawaii with, you know, some of the legends of Irish music, and bounced around, and it was like, like a, a small portion of the actual cruise was the people that came for the Irish music cruise, like maybe like uh, five hundred of us, and then the rest of the ship, which was massive, was just the regular people who just wanted to go to Hawaii. This is a common thing; wow. people are doing this all the time. There's, there's even podcasting people who are doing it, like you know. You got the the Joko Cruise for Jonathan Colton, although he's not a podcaster; he's more of a internet musician. But it's it's a thing. Cruises are a thing. Wow, I, I had I knew cruises were a thing, but I uh, I had <laughs> no idea they were this thing. Um, but it must be weird for the band though, because you're like hanging out on the boat all day with the audience, so to speak. Well, that's I think that's the great part because they get to meet the fans. These are super fans, right? They get to hang out and you know. Just do their thing, and then at night they play their music. Wow, maybe they love it. Yeah, well, they've been doing it for years, so Fucking I definitely well, think this great is kind of cool too. I am so mad. I used to see them like you know they were. I lived in L.A. in the early mid nineties, mid nineties, and they played every dive bar that I ever hung out at, but I never got to see them play. And then one day on one of my feeds, I see they open for Green Day in San Francisco at like the stadium, and I'm like. Yes, I'm never going to get to see Flogging Molly now. <laughs> That's it. It's over. It's done. So, yeah, because they got very big there for a while. That was that that show put them over the top, and now they just play festivals and stuff. It's really hard to get to see them, like in the venues that I'm used to. I'm used to small yeah. punk rock venues. You know, I used it's to see like I, lots I of those shows. I don't go to big and Mormo Dome shows anymore. Really, I mean, no, every no. once in a while I do, but generally my philosophy in life is. The more people are at it, the less I want to be near it. Yeah, absolutely. My only, my only time that I, I broke my rule was Riot Fest in Chicago. I don't know if you've ever if you've heard about Riot Fest, but no, I don't know. It's a multi day festival that they take over a park, and it's um, punk rock shows, metal shows. It's just it's a you know fifty sixty band or not even more than that, probably a hundred bands play. But 
I went last time because the band Jawbreaker got back together and played and I'd seen Jawbreaker 30, 40 times when I was a kid, but they broke up and I'm like, oh, I'm going to go back and see Jawbreaker. And it was a festival, but it was nice. I had a, actually a really good time because I got into it with all the kids that got into Jawbreaker. I'm like, you guys were, weren't even born when this band was playing. And it just turned into a big fun thing. But sometimes it can be fun. Sometimes it can. Yeah. Be. If the weather's right, there's not enough bugs and there's not a lot of traffic trying to go home. <laughs> That's really what you got to factor into it. Yeah, but there's nothing better than live music, right? Yep. No, definitely. How did how did we get to this after an AI news anchor? I don't know the random path we took to get here. I don't know. That was a that was a good that was a good one. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea either. So hey, I wanted to talk to you about this Marriott breach because it oh. blows my mind. And then I saw this crazy ass story that I sent you today. So half a billion people. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, this is a Starwood breach. This isn't a Marriott breach. Marriott right. bought Starwood and these hackers were in Starwood for years, but then Marriott took them over. So they, they basically bought the hacked company. That's half, a real half issue. a billion people, Jace. Yeah. It's like everybody who travels essentially in the United States. I mean, how have you not stayed at a Starwood hotel if you travel with any kind of regularity? Yeah, probably everybody has. Look, yeah. uh, Steve Rombaum, who's one of my favorite private detectives in the world, says privacy is dead. Get over it. And that's what you just have to deal with. Now, after the Equifax breach last year and all these other ones, you know, and, and until there is real punishment for these things happening, yeah. it's just going to keep happening. Your stuff's out there. What? And you, then you'll get the token one year of credit monitoring which then they'll just bill you for, which is even funnier. That's that's what they're going to do to compensate people for this. We're going to give you one free year of credit monitoring. Are you Pretty crazy? Much, yeah. yeah, that's a, that's, that's what the you response. Get. That that's your consolation prize, my man. It's that's your consolation prize. And look, I am not a big uh, you know more regulation guy. Far from it. But you look at this and you kind of go, I don't know. I maybe somebody needs to go to jail here. So, like, <laughs> you know, there needs to be or, or there needs to be a fine that hurts, you know, like when they find these giant banks, 20 million dollars. It's like, really, 20 million dollars is like, like I said, on, on one of my last shows, that's like their coffee creamer budget. Right. For the, for so, the staff. It's nothing. I don't know. I'm not a big regulation guy at all, but this it, there see, it's it seems to me there should be. Some well, maybe kind of the, a regulation to do this. <laughs> there, maybe maybe you might want to change your mind on the regulation bit then. Because well, without it, that, I, you know, I don't know about security. You know about security, Jason. Is it just the reality? It doesn't matter how great your security is. Sooner or later, this is going to happen to every company and every government entity. And so, yeah, it's 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 look, it's you can't stop it. You can stop it. It's it's extraordinarily difficult to stop it. And it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time and it makes your job a lot harder. And people are always the problem with this. You know, your employees are always the problem. They're the wild card. You know, anybody that comes into work and clicks on a stupid link, oh, great, now there's ransomware in our system. But yeah. there are solutions that are out there that do filter for things and can, you know, detect these kinds of things. But, I, you know, Starwood was just criminally negligent in how they handled their network. Wow, that's that is a statement. Well, they, they are. I mean, look at it, 500 million people? I wouldn't, you, you just said, you know, jail time, maybe? It, the thing it, is- It's a mind-boggling thing to think about, for sure. Yeah. And I also start to think that this is something that we're going to be talking about on Grumpy Old Geek soon. It's just I'm, I'm putting my thoughts together on this, but I honestly think the OS vendors, the operating system vendors need to be more accountable as well. I think this is something where, you know, Windows and, you know, Mac and Linux. Linux, unfortunately, is open source. So if you use Linux, you're on your own. But uh, the Mac OS and Windows these guys need to be a little bit more accountable with all the giant gaping holes that they leave open in their OS. Mm. But there should be, you know, if, if there is a reasonable way to protect your user's data and you don't do it and it gets stolen, you know, just go to, there should be fines. There should be jail time for some of the people that let this happen. GDPR right now, if you are in breach of GDPR, they can fine you for up to 4% of your gross revenues for your company for the entire year. Wow. So GDPR is really like the That's first step key. towards that. Yeah. Well, and then I thought this was interesting. 
this TechCrunch story that um, some security geeks went to work on safeguarding the world because Marriott wasn't. Oh, yeah, because the, this is a really dumb one. I mean, Marriott needs to just they, they need to fire their entire security staff right now because the emails that came out came from email. Like it was like email dash Marriott dot com, which yeah, it was email dash Marriott dot com. Yeah. How, how many R's? How many T firm? How two R's mm-hmm. and two T's. So if you if you just put one T then, you know, it could have been fished because we saw this with Equifax. They didn't use their main website. It should have just been at Marriott.com. They created a new website to send these things from, which makes zero sense at all. And everybody in in the security community was just like smacking their head going, again, does nobody learn from these things? And so a bunch of people go out and they registered all of the different variants that you can get of that dumb domain that Marriott used. Yeah. And said, hey, you could have been fished if you clicked on this link, you know? And yeah, it was this I mean, guy, Jake Williams, founder of Rendition InfoSec. Mm-hmm. And he went out and got all these various uh, misspellings. And he says, quote, I registered the domains to make sure that scammers didn't register the domains themselves, Williams told TechCrunch. Quote, after the Equifax breach, it was obvious this would be an issue. So registering the domains was just a responsible move to keep them out of the hands of criminals. This guy absolutely did this. Yeah. No, I mean, I I know so many people that have done this. I've done this on different occasions when people have stupid misspellings out there that they you know that they're going to get like a domainer that is going to get a misspelling. Good on him. Cost him a hundred bucks, probably. And now he's, you know, nationally known. So good press for him, but a good deed nonetheless. So if you need the info set, go to rendition. Superheroes wear capes, right? (laughs) That's right. That's right. So it's a good thing. I mean, he did a good job and hopefully he got them all. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But uh, I thought it was pretty, uh, it was pretty fascinating. Um. Oh, no, I, I did want to tell you this because <laughs> I found this shocking. So American Airlines. So OK, I was, I'm, I'm waiting for this one because I'm looking at the notes here and I'm like, "Ooh, this sounds interesting. So I have an American Airlines um, card mm-hmm. and on that card, it says four million miles. I have flown a lot with these people. So um, I get this text a couple of weeks ago. And it says, um, this is Charlotte with American Airlines. And sir, the reason for our call today, this is the text of her voicemail. The reason for our call today is to let you know that you have in your American Airlines Platinum account 447,000 miles that are expiring on the 7th of November. We can extend offer for you for 18 months (laughs) for $150 if you would give us a call back here. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway. Yeah. So th- for, for me to keep the miles I earned, I have to pay them, Jason. Now, are you sure this is legit? Oh, yeah. Because this sounds like a scam. No, no. This was American Airlines because I cut and paste this mm-hmm. and I tweeted it out and called them out on it. And they responded to my tweet and we had a Twitter discussion because really was, they were saying, hey, call us. And I said, well, I'll call you. But am I going to have to spend money to keep the points that I earned? And they wouldn't give me a straight answer. And then I finally got them to give me a straight answer. And the answer was yes. Wow. And because of, quote, inactivity on the account. So, yeah, what million have you <laughs> miles was inactivity on the account. <laughs> That's the what have you done for me lately clause. Yes. That's exactly what that is. Oh, you don't like us anymore? Well, then yeah, well then we're going to take your points. Ah, can you believe take that? that. Oh, that's dude, stunning, I can right? I can. I can totally believe that. I remember remember the, the show that I'm on. This is I we see this stuff all the time. There's no there's no incentive for them to keep your points around. None whatsoever. You know, you know what they should have done and said, "Hey, if you want to book a flight, we'll give you 50% off your flight and double points for your next trip." That would have been a way to keep you around. But now they're right. extorting you to keep your own points. Right. It's incredible. And so did you do it? No, absolutely not. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> Good I'm for not you. I'm giving you Good one for you. more dime. 
I am a huge customer and you have treated me like shit our entire relationship. Yeah, you, American <laughs> Airlines sucks. United is pretty bad too. Like they both are terrible. I don't know about Delta and, you know, some of the other big American carriers, but those two are unbelievable. Um, you know, I've seen this stuff go in waves because I grew up flying United since I was seven. So I've been flying United for like 40 years now. And I, I, was in Chicago, so that's their hub, and I kind of know how to navigate them and make it work. So maybe I'm just an outlier with them, but they did get bad for some time, then they get better. And I, th I see that with every airline because there's so much turnover. You, you have, you know, different staff, you have different executives, and things change over time. So it's like you can't just say that, you know, this airline sucks forever for all time because there is so much turnover. They have to bring in a new CEO to fix things when everybody like you says American Airlines sucks. I'm never American going back. Airlines has, I've been flying American Airlines for, I don't know, 25 years, maybe 30. I don't know. Long. They've sucked the whole time. They never didn't suck. Maybe there were times where they sucked <laughs> a little less, but they always sucked. Yeah. Man, you've got a serious case of sunk cost fallacy because I'd have changed airlines after they sucked for the first five years. Um, you know, you gonna, twenty-five. You now, my favorite airline is always direct, right? That's always my favorite airline. But brand-wise, um, you got to love Southwest. No, I hate Southwest. You hate I Southwest. hate Southwest. I loved Virgin America. Oh, yes. God Virgin bless. America was Me the too. best airline ever, hands down. Yes. And now that they're gone, I'm just sad. It's terrible, <laughs> so sad. right? It sucks so much. What yeah. were they thinking at Alaska to, to subsume that brand and just make it Alaska? It's like, uh, you're stupid. If, if you were smart, you would have made Alaska Airlines into Virgin America. Totally. That's exactly what they should have done. I mean, that flight oh. from San Francisco to New York on Virgin Air was a blast. It was part of the... They, they made flying an experience again. It was part of your trip you were like that was part of the trip it's part of the yeah. experience of going was being on that plane and that service and the cocktails and the whole thing yeah and and the, like the pilots coming in with their old school leather jackets and flight caps and saying hi to everybody yeah that was cool it made it into an experience you're right and and the lighting and i did figure out how to hack the online you know infotainment system the first week that they launched because i was on like the first the first three days I got one of the flights and you could crash it by playing Doom over and over again really quick. <laughs> but uh, for I, I've flown them, I flew them the first week that they were in business and I flew them the last like month that they were in business. And I was very, I was like, super excited the first, oh, yeah. the first week and then the last one. And my friend Shenny from Boing Boing, they had a, a plane named Unicorn Chaser that they named over at Boing Boing. And I flew that several times and it always put a smile on my face. When I'd like roll up to SFO and I'd see I'd be on the, the plane my friends named. I mean, like that was so cool. That's fun. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, why do you have to do that to us, Sir Richard? We love you. Well, Sir Richard just said, uh, screw it. I'm out. <laughs> you know? Yeah. He just took his money and ran. I just, it was, it was hard for them to get, hard for them to get routes here in the U.S. because yeah, the big boys scale. Yeah. With all, with all of the consolidation with the big ones. They just, you know, basically strong armed him out. And he's just like, you know what? I'm taking my bucket and going to another playground. I'm going to go do yeah. something else. Now, anything else on your uh, on your mind, Jace? No, man. This has been fun. Yeah. This has been very fun. Uh, I love how grumpy you are. <laughs> to a point, <laughs> unless I get too sophomoric. But. <laughs> no, actually, there, there really isn't too sophomoric for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know that's good to know yeah it's it's really fun i do have to say that today is one of the greatest days because uh you know i work on the jordan harbinger show i'm a producer editor and co-host there and we woke up to the news this morning that we hit the best of 2018 list from apple in itunes for podcasting wow that's started massive. in february and we still hit the list today so it's that's like massive. wow it's so cool that i mean i've had a grin on my face all day all day Huge this is the happiest you're ever going to see me <laughs> trust me that's on this a one. huge this accomplishment is, yeah. uh especially because not only the number of podcasts but the number of bigger and bigger media companies who are coming in and so as an independent podcast to stand out that way is uh i think it's a an even bigger achievement 
um, as a, as a um, you know, entrepreneurial independent business to, to be able to do that. No, it's amazing. And, you know, it all goes down to Jordan and Jen. They have been on the road so much this yeah. year. It's so much. I couldn't do it. I mean, I'm 47. I can't, I, you can't get me out of bed to even like, you know, go to 7-Eleven for creamer if I'm out, you know, and these guys are traveling around the world being on other shows, pimping the podcast, doing interviews. I just get to sit at home, play with my dogs, edit the show and do some production stuff and guest host every now and again. All the credit goes to them. But man, it's just really nice to say we started in February. We didn't even get January. We, we, we didn't even start till February yeah. and we're still in the most downloaded list. And we didn't, we didn't know we were going to make it for six months. We all basically didn't take a paycheck. And now it's like, oh, well, it hey, worked. it worked. It's yeah. very nice to see like somebody independent from us, you know, come out and say it. Cause it's not one of the things like where it's the, the iTunes top charts, which we all know are gamed to death and back right now. This is like editorially picked and yep. it's most, we're in the most downloaded cat, most downloaded new shows of 2018. And you can't kind of fake that, you know, we, no. we earned it. So no. I'm super happy about and that. So you got me on a good day, my man. My man. Awesome, man. Huge <laughs> congratulations. Um, I, I love the show. Um, I think it keeps getting better. I think it's a lot better than the old show. It's it, it, There's just a flow to it now. Um, and uh, I, I think I told you this before. That two-part episode on North Korea. Yeah, yeah. With uh, the guy from Pyongyang that, that broke out the kid. That That's that's legendary that's that's the bar that was such the demonstration of the power of podcasting it was insane yeah um so you guys have pulled off some unbelievable stuff and uh i appreciate that yeah no it's really good man uh, i'm i couldn't be more stoked for you guys yeah especially after what <laughs> happened this year Oh yeah. No, we all got screwed. I had to, I lost my home. I had to move across the country, you know, and it's just been, it's been a pretty much a crappy year for everybody. So it's nice to go out kind of on a high note. Oh yeah. No, on a big high note. Yeah. It's great. It's uh, funny too. Cause this is the, I've had other shows that have made the top of the year list in iTunes. And this is the first one I actually am on. Yeah. I get to talk on this show every every week, so it was yeah, much no, and and uh, you guys have a really good banter with each other. Oh, thank you. We actually got yeah. feedback this week that uh, said the opposite, and we, we we all looked at each other and were like, "What?" Some guy was just like, "Jordan, you're just so condescending to Jason." I'm like, "If Jordan was condescending to me, I'd take him out back and slap him. That ain't gonna happen." <laughs> it was very strange. No, I don't get that at all. That's interesting. Yeah. What people hear. It is. No, it's one of those guys things. Are, uh, you guys think about come it. across as, um, you know, longtime buddies. He's one of my best friends. friends. You know, yeah, no, I was it, at his that's wedding. That's how I read it. But, <laughs> um, but I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I know you guys a little bit, and I'm a fan, so I don't know. But it's weird that somebody would hear that. But whatever. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. dealing with and, the public, man. man. Am I ever glad it's working? You there? Yeah, I said, man, am I ever glad it's working. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you, you, you skipped there for a second. I'm like, you froze. I'm like, hey, ow, where'd you go? Where'd you go? <laughs> all right, Jason, uh, anything all right, else? Man. That's, that's what I got on my blotter. All right. Thank you so much. This has been a blast. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, man. Thanks for having me. All right, there he is, Jason DeFilippo. Do you think this is a conversation we're sharing? Was that fun or what? Um, we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared this episode right now with somebody in your life that you love or even uh, or additionally, why not put it on social media? Make no mistake. If you care at all about what we do, if you want to thank us in any way, shape or form for what we do around here, uh, you sharing the show makes the biggest difference. Now, is it grow time for your business? Our good friends at NetSuite want to help you master your growth. It's that time of year where you got to get hold of particularly um, uh, planning, planning and budgeting. Now, for some entrepreneurs, this can be a huge challenge. And uh, NetSuite has awesome capabilities for planning and reporting. It facilitates both company-wide and departmental financial planning with modeling capabilities, uh, approval workflows, reporting, and much more, all within one collaborative, scalable cloud offering. NetSuite is the 
technology that you need to get your plan on. <laughs> and for listeners of this podcast, NetSuite is offering a free one-hour growth review. Go to netsuite.com slash different, and there you'll be able to set up a one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry who can talk to you about financial planning and a whole lot more. So check out netsuite.com slash different. Now, um, I've been asked recently by multiple uh, listeners of this podcast, um, why is it you run out of time at the end of uh, every episode for someone? And uh, I thought maybe this would be intuitively obvious, but maybe it's not. If you're a longtime listener and if you have the courage to sit through all the BS at the end and uh, and hear the very last thing I do before I sign off is uh, I run out of time for someone. Well, the person that I run out of time for uh, to put it bluntly, is someone I generally think is an asshole. <laughs> now, these are people who uh, screwed me or screwed a friend of mine in business, or uh, in some cases, they're not people that I know. They're just people who I think are doing, you know, um, let's say lousy things in the world. Today, it's going to be a guy named David Brown. He's the CEO of Web.com, who is the parent company to um, uh, Network Solutions. And um, we had a complete shit show with the relaunch of Lockhead.com. And without dragging you through all the details, a big part of the problem was um, the good people at Network Solutions were, to put it mildly, not helpful. And so he's the guy I'm going to run out of time for. Um, Now, if you're somebody who uh, you got somebody in your life who you think is a a shitty person, maybe an old boss, an ex-husband, some CEO that you think is a a lousy fucker, (laughs) Uh, or just somebody you dislike for whatever reason, and you want me to run out of time for them, send email to blackhole at lockhead.com for a chance to have me run out of time for your asshole at the end of an up and coming episode of follow your different <laughs> that's black hole at L O C H H E A D.com for a chance to have me run out of time uh, for your favorite person or, or, or least favorite person. Should I say, all right, we would like to thank the amazing grumpy old geeks podcast with Probably the best tagline in podcasting. The tagline is what went wrong on the Internet and who's to blame. Check them out at GOG dot show. That's GOG dot show and the Jordan Harbinger show at uh, Jordan Harbinger dot com and wherever else you get legendary podcasts. Make no mistake. There's a reason Apple voted. The Jordan Harbinger show is one of the best podcasts on the planet. Check it out. Niche down how to become legendary by being different. The number one bestseller by Heather Clancy and myself. Check it out. The incredible people at OneLifeFullyLive.org. Dream, plan, and live your best life. This is an extraordinary nonprofit. Check them out. Um, The amazing book by Dushka Zapata. I'm holding it here in my hands. How to Build a Pillow Fort and Other Valuable Lessons. She's one of the most important writers on the planet today. Check her out on Amazon.com. Growwire.com. It's what legendary entrepreneurs are reading. Uh, it's It's where they go to learn how to grow their businesses, grow themselves, grow their ideas and get legendary stories of innovation check out growwire.com and uh, are you in australia you want to do some amazing marketing check out rapid media at rapidmedia.com.au and another nonprofit i love i recently had a chance to spend some time with john vroman the founder of the front row foundation they make moments that matter for people who have life-threatening conditions and um man oh man uh, if you ever wanted to do something incredible uh, make a donation to the front row foundation you can check them out at frontrowfoundation.org all right i need to remind you that today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes and this podcast is the sole property of the legends and losers or i should say <laughs> the lockhead oddcast network all rights do remain disturbed uh, before making any decisions or taking any action uh, from this podcast you should consult with your clergy your lawyer your doctor your accountant and your shaman don't forget to uh, support your local podcaster buy john's crazy socks tell two people you love about two podcasts you love listen to robert earl keen only by pasture raised free range eggs thank you candy dandy 
I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, deepest apologies go to David Brown, CEO of Web.com. Uh, sorry, Dave, we just ran out of time for you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that uh, you invest part of your life with me. And I uh, look forward to seeing you again on Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different.